is my Savior. Come on, if He's freed you this morning, sing it in. Sing it out. Oh, we're free, God. I'm going to ask our prayer team to come forward and if you have a need this morning, I say it all the time, we're a church that believe that God is still moving today. Whether it's a financial need or it's a physical need, whatever you need, He is here for you. He's there by your side even when you don't feel Him there. So if you have a need, we want to partner with you and pray with you as we get ready to continue in worship.
stop church oh worthy is the lamb holy 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 oh god oh you'll find me you'll find me singing worthy and worthy Lift your hands across this room in this moment. Oh, how worthy are you, God? How holy is your name? We sing to you today. We lift your name high. Let's just sing that chorus together one more time. And hold. Father, that your presence would fill this place. As we cry, holy are you, Lord. As we sing your praises to you this morning. God, we don't want to just get up here and make noise, but Father, we want to have a moment of your presence. A moment for your spirit to speak. For you to have your way. So Father, we make room for you today in this place. Jesus, we don't want to go without you. We thank you for what you're doing as we get ready to continue in our service. In Jesus' name, amen, church. Come on, why don't you put your hands together, give him a shout of praise this morning if he's been good to you. Well, you guys sound so good today. I'm so proud of you. Why don't you turn around and shake someone's hand, introduce yourself to someone new. Well, good morning. It's a beautiful Sunday. Look at this. This is wonderful. So glad you are with us today. If you don't know, uh, my name is Stevie. I'm the executive pastor here. I just want to take a quick moment and welcome you and also have a quick couple of announcements. Uh, if you are with us for the first time, though, we want to say thank you so much for taking time out of your Sunday to be here. You are our special guest this morning. And at the end of service today, I'm going to be back at the information booth. I'd love to shake your hand get to know you and your story a little bit, how you heard about us and how I can learn more about you. That's really all it's for. If you could meet me back there at the end of service, I'd really appreciate it. We have a card back there that says connect on it. It's simply so we can sell your information to Google. That's really all it's for. Just kidding, we're not gonna do that. Uh, but it's simply a way for us as a staff to find out who you are and how we can best serve you. And then a token of our appreciation, you'll leave here today with a change. <laughs> That's what happens when I joke too much. But no, seriously, uh, it, our, our way of saying thank you, you're taking time out of your Sunday to be here. You'll leave here today with a Change Life coffee mug. Again, our way of just saying thank you. Uh, so a couple quick announcements. First thing is for those who are newer to the church, we want to have dinner with you. I'm going to invite you out to Next Steps. It's a great time for you to connect with the staff, some of our board members, some of our life group leaders will be there, uh, some of our ministry directors will be there. It is simply a way for you to ask questions, uh, for you to connect with us, get to know each other on a more personal level because on Sunday mornings we realize that we are blowing and going through those doors. You got plans, you got things, but if we can sit down and have a meal together, we value that time with you. So if you're newer to the church, we invite you out to Next Steps. You can sign up for that at the information booth. Get back there. Write down how many people are coming with you so we can have the food prepared. It's a free dinner. So please, come out, hang out with us. We'd love to have dinner and get to know you on a more personal level. We would love that time with you. I have a couple other things. Uh, when it comes to summer camps, 
Summer camp information is available, one on the website. So if you have a teenager, you can scan that QR code now, and you can get all the information on the website for kids camp and for teen camp, or you can head back to the information booth. We have some packets back there. Um, I think we're running low on packets, so the website might be your best option. Get on there, find all the information. You can also pay and register online as well. We do have a couple forms that have to be paper filled out um, for the summer camp, but for majority, you can sign up online uh, to get your students going with that. So please send your students to summer camp. All right. It, trust me. It is a summer camp experience that I was at where my life was changed and turned around. And I think I turned out okay. I have this nasty little twitch that I still do sometimes. But other than that, summer camp was okay. All right. So send your kids to camp. It'd be a great experience for them. We're looking forward to summer camp this year. As we give our tithes and offerings this morning, we just want to say thank you so much. Whether you give online, you text to give, you mail it in, or you drop it off here. Thank you for partnering with us in reaching our community with Jesus. Uh, I say it all the time, and I will continue saying it. When we give, we are not giving to our organization. We are giving to see the gospel message of Jesus Christ preached in our city, in our community, and we are seeing lives changed. And we're so incredibly thankful for the impact you're making as you partner with us in this incredible journey that God's called us to. So thank you so much as you give this morning. That's all I have. I'm getting out of your way. Pastor Stan. Amen. Thanks, Pastor Stevie. I need that mic, bro. Yeah, yeah. And for the price of a tank of diesel, you can send your kid to summer camp. All right. All right. Well, Marty and Grace, I'm going to have them come up here. They'd ask to, to come up and share just a few moments. And many of you know he's, he's been struggling with some health issues and some health issues. And uh, so they wanted to come up and just say thanks to the church family. We can give them a big applause. Like, you guys are amazing people. What a good looking guy. Amen. Uh, first, I want to apologize. Uh, my meds actually started kicking in three quarters of the way after first service. Well, praise Jesus. They worked. <laughs> so, I'm really tired. Well, this might, be, this might be fun. Okay, All right. I'm <laughs> something. I'm sorry. It's okay. <laughs> um, the other thing I just wanted to say, since we're live, uh, shout out to my son who is in Miramar, San Diego. Yeah. Walter. Yeah, Walter. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, December 20th last year, I was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, and we decided to go holistic natural treatments to cure me of this. And it's not cheap, and insurance doesn't cover it. And but we're okay. God's providing for us. Amen. And family, church members here really came together and supported us with this. And we just want to say thank you to all of you. We had a yard sale here. And they were able to, you know, it was like yard chills, you're thinking fifty, hundred dollars maybe. It was five thousand dollars. Yeah. Thank you so much for how you that came out to that. Um, we want to particularly thank the Giovannis. They sacrificed their garage to store everything. Yeah. Else. So, <laughs> you guys are awesome. Everyone is awesome. Thank you so much. Amen. All right. <laughs> Sorry, Pastor. I just want to say a couple of things. I know you give me two minutes, but lo um, I just want to thank God also. <laughs> um, I want to thank all the people who prayed for us, who are praying for us. It meant to us. And when you say, I'm praying for you every day, it really touched my heart because it meant that we are not doing this by ourselves, right. but we are all doing right. together. Right. Yeah. And I do believe God will heal my husband. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. He showed a lot to me in his verses in the Bible. There are times that I was crying because I'm, I'm weak and, and my faith, you know, sometimes it goes down and I told to the Lord, Lord, give me verse for me to hang on. And then on that day, my, and I said, we've been suffering for a long time. It's been two years. The trials is almost every, every month. And I just want to tell you some of them. He got, um, he almost died in COVID 2020. He went to the emergency three times. And then after that, he got surgery. And then after that, we thought which he will be get better. But you see him, he's doing like that. Mm. And that was after the surgery. And we're not, we are not, uh, um, we are not blaming the surgery or what. And then after that, because of that surgery and he can't do the job, He's working in, he works in juvenile detention and they need him to tackle the kids and because of that, he lost his job. 
And after that, on top of that, the insurance does not want to pay for it because they thought it was an accident, and it was an accident. And then after that, his fa his, our father-in-law had COVID and he passed away. After that, one month, we do not have water because we do not know that we have a leak. And then after that, this one. And then when I found this, I felt like, God, what? And then the enemy put in my head, in my head like, is God good? And then I almost buy that, but I know God is still good. That's right. And when That's right. I find that, no, God is still good, no matter Amen. what, yeah. God is still good. And yeah. because of that, the strength came back, and that the, the head of the enemy like, wants to tell me that God is not good. That makes me weak. But when I said that God is good, Amen. the spirit goes up. And there's a lot of things also that he did for me. I was cleaning the church and I fell down again and I said, Lord, I fell down today. Will you please give me a song that will encourage me? And the song that came out in 89.5 says, we will see the victory because the battle belongs yeah, to the right. Lord. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And I was crying and then it says, the enemy meant for evil, but the Lord will yeah. turn out for good. And that's I right. know that this trial yeah. And I want you to pray for Marty's family. Yeah. Marty is the only one who, who, who is a believer. And I do believe that they are watching for us. How do we respond to this? Yeah. And I, yeah. I, my prayer is that God will radically, radically, um, miraculously, miraculously uh, heal Marty. And then the family will see that God is the only one who did it. Yeah. It's not the Holy Spirit. Mm. It's not the doctor. But they will realize that God, there is God. Yeah. And I, I, I'm asking you to pray for his family because I know God is coming soon. And we love our family yeah. and we want them to be saved also. Amen. Amen. And we just give all the glory. Amen. 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 Thank you for Amen. That was so fine. Hey, yeah, we're gonna, yeah, <laughs> she, she preached. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much uh, for Marty. And we do ask that you glorify yourself in this situation, Father. We pray for healing. We are a church that absolutely believes in prayer and the power of miracles. You still do them today. And so we just speak healing into Marty's body. Um, and maybe even more importantly, his family, that they would come to know you through this. And we just pray for your peace and your season of blessing upon them. Uh, but we just pray, uh, Jesus, that you would heal them. In your precious name we pray. Amen. 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 Hey, man. Well, thank you so much, church. How's everybody doing today? Doing good? Doing good? Thank you for joining us online if you're there. And uh, it feels hot outside, yeah. right? I'm almost going to shed my shirt, but I wouldn't do that. Not in public. Might freak my wife out. Might freak you out more. Um, all right. But uh, here today to preach a message, I'm excited about this message. Uh, the plan is to have some fun today. Uh, we've been going through a, a story for the last couple months. Uh, we kind of got out of our, our series called, or not climate change. Is it climate change? <laughs> no, make it count. Let's make it, no, make it matter. I'm over 50. I just forget stuff. I don't care. Uh, and uh, make it matter. We talked about uh, King David before he was king and how King Saul was the first king of Israel. And, uh, you know, Israel's like, we want a king like everybody else. And God's like, I'm your king. And they're like, yeah, but we want a human king. And then God's like, all right, you can have what you want. And they discovered that King Saul wasn't a very good king. Have you ever, you ever got what you wanted? Like, you want it, you want it, you want it, you want it. And people are like, no, don't, 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 don't. And then you do. And you're like, why did I? You ever have those moments, right? Uh, we, sometimes in relationships, we get this. Sometimes it's like a new car or whatever, and, and it's great until the first payment. And then the insurance, and you're like, ah, what did I do? Um, and that's what Israel was like. And so God told Samuel, the prophet, you know, go anoint David. David was just a young man. He was out in the field, you know, watching the sheep. Uh, we went through the whole story that, that God gave him a promise, but the promise had to have a process, and, and when you have a promise from God, there's always a process that you have to go through. Um, and so two weeks ago, uh, did my wife do a great job last week? Yeah. She did a great job. There's tons of feedback. Um, if she wasn't my wife, I'd be kind of concerned about my job with all the positive feedback. It was like, yes, Dan, his latest thousands, but Chris are tens of thousands. 
If you've been in the study, you wouldn't be like, what are you talking about? Uh, that, that's what Saul's problem was. Saul's problem was, was David was getting all this praise from the people of his kingdom, and he got jealous, and, and he started having this attitude toward David. David didn't even do anything wrong. He did everything right, and he was still getting picked on. And so today's title, because I love titles, because that's what you remember, is Free by Forgiveness. Uh, when we talked about Saul's life, it was bound by bitterness. Like his life was so bound up in bitterness and he was so mad at David that he couldn't even enjoy life. And matter of fact, he spent the rest of his days trying to kill David uh, to prevent him to become a king because of this jealousy. Uh, but today's a little more fun because God has called us to be free. Amen? He's called you to be free. And it says, he who the sun sets free is what? Free sometimes. No, free indeed. Right? You are free and God wants that for you. And so um, at the end of each year, at least I as a, as a human have to go through health insurance plans. And every year we have to look at different plans. And usually there's the silver, the gold, and the platinum. And, and let me tell you something today, because some of you may have been raised in different religions, uh, that there's, as far as heaven goes, there's not a, a, a silver, gold, and platinum level. Like if you did okay, then you get the lowest level of heaven. Um, and, and why do I say that is, is because the thief on the cross, when we talk about his story, uh, because some of you are trying to, man, earn, you're trying to earn your way. Like you like, yeah, I know I'm saved by Jesus, but I got to earn my way up. That's not the way it works in the kingdom of God. Uh, the thief on the cross was with Jesus the day he died. And let me tell you, Jesus was at the platinum level. Right? And that thief was there. All right. Some of you all, it's, 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 there's, a, there's a fourth plan. It's fire insurance. All right. You got the silver, gold, platinum, and then there's fire insurance. It's like, okay, I need to give my life to Jesus so that I don't go to hell. Now, that's a pretty good motivator. Like hell's a, hell's a reason, but we don't give our life to Jesus just to escape the flames. Like there's a greater benefit of serving God throughout our life. All right, so we're going to talk about plans today. I need you to understand something before we get into our message is there's two plans for your life. There's God's plan and there's a devil's plan. We, we talk a lot in church about God's got a plan, but you know the devil's also got a plan? Yep. The devil's got a plan. God's plan is for you to live in freedom. The devil's plan is for you to live in bondage. That's his whole goal. The whole, the whole goal of the devil is to, to get you bound in something, and a lot of times he'll use uh, bitterness to do that. So uh, I want to read you a story first. I found this this week, and um, if it makes me laugh, like if I'm in my office and I read the story, I, I, I want to share it in church. It's called When Nothing Goes Right. A young man was learning to be a paratrooper. Before his first jump, he was given the instructions by his drill instructor. Number one, jump when you're told. Number two, Count to 10 and then pull the ripcord. Number three, in the unlikely event that your first parachute does not open, pull the emergency ripcord. Number four, when you land, a truck will be there to take you back to the airport. The young man wanting to be a good soldier, a good paratrooper, memorized these instructions through and through, climbed aboard the plane. The plane climbed to 10,000 feet and the paratroopers began to jump. When the young man was told to jump, he jumped. He counted to 10, pulled his ripcord, Nothing happened. No chute opened. So he grabbed the emergency ripcord. He pulled it. Still, nothing happened. No parachute. Oh, great, said the young man. And I suppose the truck won't be there when I land either. <laughs> you ever had a bad day? <laughs> like when just things just don't seem to go right? And this guy had a delusional idea. There would be a truck to pick his body off the ground. All right. But sometimes in life, we feel like that guy. We have so many failures and disappointments that we just don't expect anything to go right for us. And, and that, that's not how God wants you to live. All right. Life is going to be full of trials. It's going to be full of things uh, that we face. The question is, how are we going to face those? So the recapping on the story that we've been going through, Saul, uh, the king, is bound by bitterness because he left the door open to the devil. And, and I will tell you, because I like to be real in church, I like to be real wherever I'm at, is some people like being bitter. They just do. You know anybody like that? They just, they just like to be bitter. That They look for reasons to be bitter. If life is good, they'll find some reason to be bitter. They'll blame others okay, for their bitterness. They look to justify or look for a reason to be mad at something or somebody. Their life's motto is, I'm mad and it's your fault. Yeah. That's their motto. Like, I'm mad and it's your fault. Because, it, you know, it can never be my fault. It can never be nothing that I did. It's got to be you. There's got to be an outside source for my inward pain, okay? Very few people admit that their misery is their own fault. And I will tell you, if, you have, if you're willing to admit, man, I did this and I caused this, you're, you're mature, more mature than most people. 
That is a level of maturity. When you take responsibility for how your life is turning out and when you actually cause the problem and you're like, yeah, that's my fault, okay? that's, that's actually a sign of maturity. Okay? In, in, in marriage counseling, one of the things that we teach, because I've been taught this, is the most mature person apologizes first. Sometimes I don't want to be mature. Like, you know, and I just want to oh, hold on to it, right? All right. So, so Saul, again, it's his own misery. It's his own fault. He's miserable. Why was, why was King Saul miserable? If you haven't been here for very long and you didn't hear that part of the story, uh, King Saul started out really good. I mean, he was a good person as a king. That's why he was picked. Uh, but something happened over time. He began to fear people. He began to be insecure, and those insecurities came out. And when you're insecure, right, you will start taking a poll as a leader. Instead of being a leader, you will actually become a politician. You will kind of see what everybody wants, and then you'll go, okay, this is what I believe now because this is what the people want, and this is what's going to get me elected, and so I'm going to go that way. But a real leader says, I kind of, I love you, but I don't, I don't, I'm not going to care what everybody thinks. I have to make this decision based on reality and based on leadership. I'm not going to be a jerk about it, but I'm going to lead. A politician really isn't a leader. They just kind of want to do what everybody thinks. The problem is that when you lead a bunch of people, you have a bunch of different directions. Okay? Do I get an amen? All right? And that's the way it is. Okay? A leader says, okay, this is the way we need to go. Saul became a politician rather than a leader. And he began to disobey God. God would give him direct orders, and he would disobey those orders. And then he'd be like, well, the people wanted to do this. And, and he did that enough times that God says, you know what? I can't use you anymore. I still love you, but I can't use you. You're not being the king that I need you to be, so I'm going to remove you, and there's going to be a man that's going to come up and take your spot, which would be King David, but it wasn't a fast thing. It would take over 15 years for this process to take place. All right? Thinking back over, over the story, my Aunt Bev, anybody grow up in Sunday school? Like, anybody grew up in church? Like, you had to be there? It was like five of us. Wow. No wonder most of you struggle. Um, <laughs> No, yeah. Okay. I grew up in Sunday school, and, and where I grew up, our town was so little, our cow pasture was actually in between our house and the church. Like, we walked across the cow pasture to get to church. And the weird part, we were 30 seconds away, and we were always late. It was like, what's up with that, right? Uh, and, and I remember my Aunt Bev, she was one of my Sunday school teachers. She was talking about Moses and Exodus, and I remember her taking us, you know, out in the parking lot, and, uh, and I had the, the staff, and I got to be Moses, and, you know, because there was only one of us in Sunday school class, and no, there was like three or four, and, and I got to lead the, the group through, you know, the parking lot as Moses and part the waters, but she came to the lesson about the bitter water, where they were in the desert, and they came up on this pool called Mara, which is bitter, means bitter, and so they started to drink it, and they were like, ah, oh, we can't drink it, we're going to die, and, and God's like, okay, cut some branches off, throw it in there, and it'll be Become, you know, sweet. And so they did this. So she, she got this cup and, and she got lemonade. And this was before country time. This was back when you had the packets of lemonade. Remember those? You, you're, Chris, did you ever lick those things? Did you ever live on the edge? I'd be like, yeah. yeah. And, and, and so she made lemonade and we all drank it and she didn't put any sugar in it on purpose. And we were like, oh, you know, it was, and she kind of laughed about that. And, and it was why it was bitter. What she had in the cup was bitter. And so what I found was the more you complain about the bitterness, the sweeter it gets. The more I share, my life's bitter, my life's my bitterness, this, all of a sudden it just turns sweet. Uh, totally lying to you right now, all right? So what she did was, was she, she actually brought out the sugar, okay? She brought out the sugar because, and that, and that represents grace and forgiveness in your life. In a bitter situation, it does not get sweet on its own. Okay, you have to add something to it for it to get sweet. And so she taught us this lesson that what, what God did was like sugar. So the question that we will kind of deal with today is, are you sugar or are you bitter? Are you the type of person that's going to, to bring sugar to a rough situation? Because the rough situation by itself does not get sweeter. You have to add something to it. So in our lives, when we were not serving Jesus, all right, we tried and tried in different ways to make our life sweeter, but it didn't work. Why? Because Jesus is the only solution to the bitterness. And so, so this is going to represent grace. It's going to represent forgiveness today, all right? First Samuel chapter 18, 10 through 12, we've gone through the story a few times, uh, but we need to go through it again because here is the scenario. Uh, David, again, he, he gets, had these big victories. He kills Goliath. He wins a victory for the war. He's serving uh, King Saul. He's playing his harp, and he's just this anointed musician because Saul had this demonic spirit that was coming against him and just, just disrupting his life. And so he's, he's playing 
And something happens, all right? Saul now has is very jealous toward David, and he does something to him. It says, the next day, verse 10, an evil spirit from God, and this is an evil godly spirit. God allowed an evil spirit okay, to, to mess with Saul because Saul just had the door wide open, came forcefully upon Saul. He was prophesying in his house, which the, the, he, or the Greek word is, I'm sorry, Hebrew word is babbling. He's just talking out of his mouth. you ever seen somebody who's just so strung out on drugs, they just babble? Have you ever seen anybody that's not struggling on drugs and they just like to babble? Okay, so you can babble whether you're stoned or not, okay? And he was just babbling out of his mind. And King David was playing the harp as he usually did. And Saul, okay, being a good, gracious king, had a spear in his hand. Saul always had a spear in his hand. I'm reading through the 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, and you will see Saul with a spear in his hand. You know some people like this. You know some people who are always, they're ready to chuck a spear. They're ready to give their input. They're ready just to, to, to poke you with something, all right? He had a spear in his hand, and, and David's playing, and Saul hurls it, okay? He hurls it, saying to himself, I will pin David to the wall. But David eluded him twice. Now, there's a key word there, t- key word twice. Now, Pastor Stevie dared me to throw this today. So what we're going to do is, I'm, everybody's going to close your eyes, and... <laughs> I don't know, you know, who's living in sin or not, but we're going to pray that the spear finds its mark, like who needs it the most. You know? uh, but when you, you're all looking at me now, like, okay, is he really going to throw that? Remember, Pastor Stevie's a little more violent than I am. Um, he says, I really hope you throw that today. I'm not going to, I'm not going to throw it. Uh, I don't like to fix sheetrock holes. Okay. As a, as a professional painter, it's like, don't mess with sheetrock holes. All right. But King David, I mean, sorry, King Saul, he just had his spear and he chucks it at David. David ducks. Now, it says it happened twice. Does that mean Saul went, hey, man, you got good reflexes. Give me my spear back. You know, and David's like, <laughs> I'd be like, here you go. You can have it point first, right? And, and he gets it back. Most likely a servant brought it back to him. And now David is playing with both eyes on Saul. He's like, this guy just tried to spear me. Right? And, and he's playing, you know, how great is our gun? And he's, he's watching King Saul. The king is crazy. And, and God is great, but the king is crazy. And then all of a sudden, boom, it happens again. Yeah. Okay, two times he, he throws the spear at him. And it says Saul was afraid of David. I'm like, okay, should, David should have been afraid of Saul because the Lord was with David and uh, had left Saul. But that was Saul's fault, okay? Saul was bound by bitterness. And you can be bound by bitterness or you can be free by forgiveness. It's all your choice. And let me tell you something. You have a purpose in life. God has a purpose for your life. But if you are bound by bitterness, you will never accomplish that purpose. Right? And that's what we're dealing with today. And that's why, you know, last week's lesson or last month, two weeks ago, lesson was a little harder because we're talking about the bondage that, that bitterness will bring. Today is more of a fun message because I want to get you out of it if you're bound in it. I want you to become what God wants you to become. God wants you to become what he wants you to become. But, but a life of purpose and bitterness do not mix. You can't be both. You, you can't be a really bitter person and really accomplish God's will for your life. Why? Because bitterness spreads. So here's the question of the day, all right? How can I live a life of emotional freedom? Like you might be here today and, and you're free, okay? You might be online. You might be, maybe you're in prison or jail and you're watching this. Okay, you can be physically bound up, but you can be emotionally free. And you can be physically free and emotionally bound up. Right? And we need to deal with that today. And that's my heart. So everybody has a different situation. Some of you have had tremendously hurtful things happen to you. Other people, you know, the spears are a little bit different. But everybody has to deal with offense, Everybody has to deal with something that we need to forgive, okay? That's the, so let me, let me word it this way. Every situation is different, but the answer is the same. The answer is forgiveness, okay? The answer is grace. The answer is, is found in the sugar shaker, okay? Do you like sugar or do you like salt? Depends on the situation, doesn't it, all right? But I like sugar. I don't like my coffee black like y'all do sometimes, you know? Yeah. I like it sugared up. All right, I do. Some of y'all like the bitter coffee. That's okay. Makes you more of a man than me. (laughs) Or maybe more of a woman. Depends on who you are, okay? And I hope it makes you more of a woman than me because I ain't becoming one. Uh, All right? (laughs) Born a man, I'll stay that way. All right? How can I live a life of emotional freedom? We face this every day, guys. If you you commute, you, you face this. If you have to drive anywhere, you face traffic, you face situations. If you work at home, okay, 
Lord, have mercy on your soul because I can be hard too, right? I, per- I personally like my office, okay? I, I like my home office. I like my home. I love my family. But there are times that I just need to get away to my office, all right? But every single one of us have the opportunity to be offended. Every single one of us every day get to practice this. And here's what I've learned. Uh, May was, is significant for me. Uh, this is, uh, May was marks 31 years of full-time ministry. Um, and, and I'm more excited now than I was then. Yeah. All right? I'm probably a little more humble because when I came out of Bible college, I'm like, God's man of faith and power. You know, I'm going to change the world. And then, and then it's like, hey, clean the toilets. Mow the yard. Okay? I'll say, okay. I was a children's pastor, the youth pastor, the associate pastor, the janitor, the grounds maintenance guy, and whatever else fell in between, all right? That's, that was my first job description, and I made a 1000 bucks a month, which would give you about three tanks of diesel um, in today's economy, yeah. all right? And, and, and yet I was willing to do it, okay? Whatever it is that God wants me to do, I'm going to do. And here's what I've learned in a lot of years of ministry, and you've learned this too. If you lead people, you can't help people who don't want to be helped. You just can't. Like, if they don't want to be helped, if they enjoy bitterness, like, and they got their cup, and you're like, hey, let me put a little sugar, and then you're like, no, keep your sugar away from my bitterness. You know anybody like that? They're they're fun to mess with, huh? And and there's a point you're like, you know, I really don't want to be friends with you anymore, because all you do is share your bitterness. I I want to be sugar, and I'm not always sugar, trust me, okay? Uh, Thanks for not amening. That made me feel pretty good, actually, Uh, but there's some truth to it. Some people are capable of living on the streets. They really, in America, let me tell you something. I've seen some pictures lately of some of our cities and the tent cities. Let me tell you something. And I know that you'll agree with me on this. Every person in one of those tent cities has the ability in America to get out of it. Yep. They do. We, you and I pay taxes for government programs that if somebody wants out of it bad enough, in America, you can. You can. Now, other third world countries... Right? Different story. But in America, you could be a, that you live there because you want to. And they might argue, well, no, I don't want to. No, you, you do. Yeah. Right? Because you can make an excuse. But America offers places. We have programs to get people out of that. The problem is, is we get comfortable with it. We get comfortable. And that's just truth preaching, isn't it? Okay? Yeah. How does that apply to me? Well, I can choose to get out of bitterness. I can choose to forgive. Regardless of what's been done to me, I can still choose to forgive. It's my choice. I, I can't say, well, I just can't. Well, no, it's not that you can't, it's that you won't, right? There's a difference between can't and won't. We can get out of our situation, but we have to want it to. So, so here's the fact we face, all right? God wants you to grow and mature in your faith and relationships. And for that to happen, we have to learn how to forgive. Some of you, listen to me, listen to me close. Some of you got to forgive every day. Some of you have had somebody hurt you bad enough that every morning you have to get up and say, God, I don't like that person right now. And it might have happened 30 years ago, 40 years ago, but, but I'm struggling with this. God, I'm going to get up in the morning and I'm going to verbally say, I forgive so-and-so for doing what they did. And when you verbalize that, when the devil hears you every morning, get up and say, I am going to, ver- I'm, I'm going to forgive them. I, I forgive them. I don't even really have to like them, but I have to forgive them. And so I'm going to choose to forgive them. The more you do that, I think the less grip it has on you yeah. because the devil loves isolation. He likes you to think that you're the only one that got hurt ever by this. You ever have the devil whisper to you that you're the only one that's ever been tempted by the one temptation you faced? He's like, no human in history has ever thought about that kind of temptation. And the devil's like, <clears throat> tempt people with this all the time, every generation. Do you really think you're that special? That out of the billions of people, you're the only one the devil has tried that on? Like he's got a tackle box full of lures and he's like, only this one's going to work on Stan. It won't work on any other man in the whole world, but this one will work on him. No, the devil's got like three or four lures. Well, for men, he's got about two. Um, and uh, that he uses, yeah, women, I mean, there's a whole tackle box full, and it's sparkled, it's bejeweled, it has all kinds of shiny things on it. And the devil's always picking them out, going, hmm, which one's this going to work? And they're all shiny, yeah. right? Good. Men are so much easier to tempt than women are, I think. Um, but I just say that from a man's perspective. It's so much harder to be, yeah, right, thank you. All right, let's just move on. It's true, but the devil wants to tempt you. That's his whole thing. But here's the fact we face. Every day in your life, you will be offered an opportunity to be offended. Every day. Every day. Some of y'all walk out of this church offended at something I said. Some of y'all don't care that, you know, five people gave their hearts to Jesus Christ. It's just that I said that one little thing you didn't like, and that's what you think about driving home. You know what I would say? Shame on you. Yeah. Right. Right. People got saved and you're complaining that, you know, he said that one little thing that you didn't like and the tone of voice that you didn't like and the little voice that you didn't like and you drive all the way. 
Actually, you probably don't because they probably went to another church, but y'all like what I preach on, right? Amen. But isn't that crazy how we're like that? Yeah. There, there, something great can happen. Eternity can be, can be changed and we complain, well, I didn't like that song. I, didn't like, I love that when people say, please don't, please don't ever tell me that because I will light you, brother. I will grab my spear. I will light you up. Yeah. Don't ever, don't ever say, well, I just didn't like that song. Oh, we were singing to you? Yeah. <laughs> Stand, I lift your name on high, right? No. You know what? I've had people say that to me, and I will defend Kristen to the day I die on our worship, because we have top not worship, right? We do. We do. And uh, that's just who we are, right? I don't think God has ever offended a church singing songs to him, okay? It's not, all right? But I've had people, I just didn't like that song. And I'm like, oh, I didn't know it was about you. Right. That wasn't even in my notes, but I think maybe somebody needed to hear it. But, uh, but I will tell you, please don't ever go to her. Don't ever go to me and say, I didn't like that. Because she prays about, like, what, what, is, what do we need for Sunday, okay? That's a, that's a, that's a big deal. All right. So, anyway, that was for free. Because it wasn't in my notes. But it needed to be said. All right. But here's what I know about the devil, okay? If the devil offers it to you, it's bad for you. If he offers it to you, it's bad for you. Um, I shared some weeks ago the story about when I did something stupid as a 12-year-old. Um, and I was, we were throwing whiskey bottles into a swimming hole, right? I told you the story. We were off the cliff, and we didn't know where we were throwing. It was just shattering. And, uh, and then we went up the creek at our logging camp, and that was, it was our swimming hole. Well, the same swimming hole had some trout in it. And, uh, and I, was, I was thinking about you know, this message that I was preaching uh, about the devil offering you things. It was a particular trout that we were able to catch, I think it was two times. And it was only about this big, wasn't very big. And, uh, and we used salmon eggs. And I remember we, we, we you know, let it go down with the entrance and it's in there swimming, it's waiting for something. And it bit it. We're like, yeah, we got it, we got it. And then the second time, did it again, boom, hooked it. And the third time it was like, nope. And we'd dangle it in front of its face. We tried different lures. We tried, we tried all this thing. And that fish would just wait for the real stuff. And I thought, man, that fish, I want to be like that fish. Because the devil likes to dangle the same things, right? Maybe a different shape, different size. But he dangles things in front of us, and we keep biting it. And that fish was smart enough to go, you know what? Fool me once, fool me twice. But three, third times, I'm not going to bite that thing. It's got a hook in it. It's got a hook in it. That's what the devil does. Now, I do have to make a confession here that I invented eyebrow piercing at this fishing hole. Seriously. <laughs> I did. My friend Bart was behind us, and he might be watching online from Eureka, California. And, and Bart was behind me, and you never get behind somebody who's casting, right? right? And, and he was sitting back there, and, and so I went, I was like, what? And I heard a scream. He's like, ah! And I took back, and I caught a Bart. <laughs> uh, and, and I hooked him right here. Yeah, and, it, and, and, and I was like, so I invented eyebrow piercing. Now, that also makes me responsible. So if your kid wants it, Please don't blame me. Um, the funnier part was it had a salmon egg on it. And so the salmon egg burst when it hooked him. And the salmon egg is running down his face. And he's like, ah! I'm like, but it's not blood. I mean, there was a little bit of blood, but it was mostly salmon egg. And he's freaking. And I'm, you know, still trying to jerk it out of his head. No, we got the pliers and we did some surgery right there. Um, there's no point to that part of it, but it happened. And it's funny. I hooked him, okay? The whole point to me is about the trout. Yeah. It's about the trout who, who figured out this is going to get me and never would bite it again. He would come up and he would eat the rule. We were just trying to get him, trying to get me. It was a very, very smart trout. But here's what I know about the devil. If you keep eating it, he's going to keep serving it to you. If you keep getting offended at stuff, the devil's going to make sure that he has plenty of things for you to be offended about. And I don't want to live a life of offense, okay? Um, I have a, a little Havanese dog. And uh, many of you, I talk about Maddie. Maddie's my buddy. And, and I created a problem. I really did. She's a beggar. Like, she begs. It, like, I, I feed her little scraps, and I know I'm not supposed to. My brother's like, yeah, because he does, he, like, knows animals. And he's like, yeah, actually, you can kill her. And uh, so I just feed her more food. Um, <laughs> no, you know, I love my little dog. And she's just the sweetest dog. But she begs, and it's my fault. Totally, 100% responsible because I feed her things. Like, you know, she does tricks. She's super smart. I make her do little tricks. And, and the other day she was begging and I was annoyed. I was eating taco salad and, and I had a lot of hot, I love hot sauce. And, uh, and she was like begging, like in my, like, I was like, get, get out of here. Like, and I'm like, I created the problem and now I'm pushing it away. 
you know, and, and so finally, Chris is sitting on the couch. Finally, I, I doused the chip in hot sauce, Garrett. I did, it was awesome. And she's like, hey, and I gave it to her. And she bit it, and she went, starts sneezing, and her face was going, and she, she gets over and sits by Chris. And they're both glaring at me. Chris is like, that was mean. Why'd you do that? I was like, she deserved it. She's begging, so I'm going to get her what she wants. I'm going to give her what she wants. I'm going to teach a spiritual principle here. And... <laughs> It, it didn't matter. I still, I, I got, she, I, she was still glaring at me. Like, that was me. I can't believe you did that. I'm like, you can't believe I did that after 30 years of marriage. You can't believe I did that. <laughs> like, come on. Right. And so it was, I thought it was funny. And, and so then the next day I was eating some more again and I put hot sauce on a chip and the dog comes over and it smells it and he goes back and lays on the couch. Like, don't mess with me. And then I did even better. I forgot to tell us in first service. I put hot sauce on the chip and stuck it on the floor. Like on the hardwood. And she comes over and she's like, I want to bite it, but I don't want to bite it. I want to bite it, but I don't want to bite it. It was just this battle of good and evil that I was watching play out in front of me. And she decided not to bite it. She, she quit begging for a few days. Right? She quit begging for a few days. But the devil loves to just offer you things, but it always has a hook in it. It always has something. So we need to be like the trout and Maddie to go, okay, I smell something fishy here, right? I'm not going to bite this because it's going to be bad for me. I want to go into David's heart just for a moment, because David, he has this reaction to the king's behavior. Here's a man who, he, you know, he marries his oldest daughter, I'm sorry, second daughter, second oldest daughter, he becomes a son-in-law, and now the guy's trying to kill him, okay? And this, this actually happened before the wedding. He tried to kill him twice, and then he tried to spear him again afterwards. So he tries to spear him twice. He goes ahead and agrees to, to marry Michael, his daughter, uh, after the you know, attempted murder incident, and, and so he must be a little bit confused here. Like, what do I do? I got a father-in-law that hates me and wants to kill me. He, you know, I'm winning these great battles, and yet he's trying to kill me. And so my point with this part is this. This great victory is now followed by a great trial. And oftentimes in our lives, in your life, you have a victory spiritually or something great will happen, and then a trial will come. And why do we need to hear that? Because even a man like David who loved God with his whole heart still had bad things happen to him. Still had things happen that he would rather not have dealt with, okay? Imagine this confusion he must have gone through as I'm just doing the best I can and I'm trying to serve the king and I'm winning his battles and I'm, I'm not even trying to take his job and he's, tr he's trying to kill me. So emotionally, you can, might be able to grasp what he's going through here. Um, I want to show you... A, Okay, a, a, a statue, it's a sculpture of David by Michelangelo. And here's, here's what I'll tell you before I talk about this. When Samuel anointed David as a future king, because he was just a young man, I don't think he had any clue what he had to go through to get there. I think it's Samuel, when he whispered to him, and he was probably you know, 12, 13 years old, like basically you're the future king of Israel. I, I think David didn't go, okay, what's this gonna take to, for me to get to that position? What am I gonna have to go through? It was, God was kind of silent on it. But when Michelangelo was questioned, and I had to have my daughter, she does all my PowerPoints, I say, you have to pick the PG version. <laughs> Please do not Google Michelangelo sculpture in church. Um, you might offend the person behind you. All right, and, and so, I, she, so she picked this picture, and you look at the detail, and this thing is actually really, really tall. Um, and so I, I joked first service that the body is Pastor Stevie's body, and the head's mine. <laughs> but then I realized I don't even have near that much hair, so I can't even use that. Um, so I'm not even in the picture, all right? What I didn't tell you was we didn't show the feet, because he actually has four toes. It's true. Plus one. He's got five. He's got them all, all right? If you don't know me, you won't get that until later. <laughs> All right. So here's David. David, at one point, was a solid block of rock. And as the story goes, Michelangelo, the guy said, how did you do it? Because Michelangelo had a hammer and he had a chisel. He had to chisel the whole thing. He said, how did you do it? And Michelangelo's response, he said, he said David was always in there. I just had to chip away what didn't belong. Amen. Man, I love that. You could stop right there and say, that is a lesson that, that we need to learn, that God knows what's in us. He knows that David is in us. He knows something beautiful, something amazing is in us, but he's got to chip away everything that doesn't belong. And how does he do that? He goes through trial. He uses it, trials. He uses, it, he uses temptations. He uses all kinds of things to get off of us what doesn't belong so that what does belong can come out. Okay? It's just a beautiful, beautiful depiction. I just have to take away... What does it belong? Now, I want you to think about this for a moment. If Michelangelo did, did David's head first, I don't know what part he did first, but if he did his head first and those eyes could see, 
Imagine Michelangelo coming up in the morning and sharpening his chisels, getting his hammer out, and David would be like, what was that for? <laughs> He's like, I got some work to do. Because anybody coming at me with a chisel and a hammer, I'm going to back up. Right? But the hammer and the chisel is a tough thing. It's a thing that God uses to get off of us. And a lot of times we, we want greatness, but we don't, don't want to go through what it takes to get there. Greatness okay, is in you. We just have to be willing to go through the process. And God uses things like being grateful or grateful and graceful to get there. All right? So you will have spears thrown at you. Okay? You will. You will get offended. Promise you. You will get offended. Every day of your life, you have an opportunity to get offended. The question is, how long will you stay offended? Right. A couple of weeks back, I used the illustration with a tea bag and a clear glass and, and, and hot water. And the longer it stayed in there, the darker it got. The darker it got. I don't want offenses to stay in me because I don't want to become dark. I want to become what God wants me to become, not a dark version. Now, uh, I grew up in the mountains, and I remember my dad in his medicine cabinet had a snake bite kit. Anybody remember those? It looked like a giant pill, and they pulled it. There was a razor blade on it and a suction cup. The theory was if, if you get bit by a rattlesnake, make an incision over the bites and then use the suction cup to work. Well, uh, there was a, two guys that were out hunting and uh, one of his buddy got bit by a, the rattlesnake and they had cell service. And so the guy didn't know what to do. And, and, and so he calls the doctor. He says, doctor, my friend just got bit by a rattlesnake. What do I do? What do I do? And the guy says, well, you make an incision where the cut is. Um, and, and then you, you suck it out with the, the suck. He goes, I don't have one of those. I got a knife. That's all I got. He goes, well, you have to use your mouth. You need to get that poison out. And the doctor says, well, where did he get bit? He goes, in the butt. <laughs> so he hangs up and the guy's laying there going, what did the doctor say? What did the doctor say? And he goes, you're going to die. You're going to die. You're going to die. You're gonna die. <laughs> it's an old story, but I think it's still funny. Okay. Where to get the poison out, right? But some people are like David. What made him different? He didn't retaliate. He didn't retaliate to it. The, the, the spear was pulled out of the wall and given back to the king. Who in their right mind would do that? Who in their right mind would continue to, to obey and play the harp knowing that the guy is trying to kill you? Okay, there's a book that, that I would encourage you to read. It's by Gene Edwards. I had it for a lot of years. And it's titled A Tale of Three Kings. And it goes through King Saul, King David, and King Absalom, which is David's son. And a whole messed up family. You think having seven wives is a great idea? Read the entire story and see what kind of messed up family it was. I mean, there's, there's a brother raping a sister. I mean, it, it's, you know, on the surface, like, ah, oh, three, you know, seven beautiful wives. That's not, that's not the family. It messed up a lot of things. All right. But this book, uh, he, he talks about this particular incident in here. And again, if, you've, if you're in any type of leadership, get the book and read. It's a really fast read. But here's what, he, here's what he says about this situation. He says, unlike anyone else in spear throwing history, David did not know what to do when the spear was thrown at him. He did not throw Saul's spear back at him, nor did he make any spears of his own and throw them. Something was different about David. All he did was dodge the spears. And what can a man, especially a young man, do when the king decides to use him as target practice? What if the young man decides not to return the compliment? Well, first of all, he must pretend that he cannot see the spears, even when they're coming straight at him. Second, he must learn to duck very quickly. And last, he must pretend that nothing happened. So you can easily tell when someone has been hit by a spear, he turns a deep shade of bitter. David never got hit. Gradually, he learned a very well-kept secret. He discovered three things that prevented him from ever being hit. Number one, never learn anything about the fashionable, easily mastered art of spear throwing. Number two, stay out of the company of all spear throwers. And three, keep your mouth tightly closed. In this way, spears will never touch you, even when they pierce your heart. And it's a beautiful, beautiful way that he writes this uh, because David was affected by this. David wasn't just some dense person who laughed, oh, you tried to spear me again. It, this was no laughing matter. David's heart was very much hurt emotionally that a king that he served and gave his best to was actually trying to kill him just because other people were singing David's praises. So emotionally, he had to be in this place of why is this going on? So the rest of the story, okay, and here's, here's, you know, you may know people like this, okay? Stuff just doesn't seem to get to them. It's not that they don't care. They've just learned how to handle spear throwing, okay? In other words, their life motto may be this. I'm not going to let someone hold me emotionally captive by their behavior. Amen. Let me read that again. I am not going to let someone hold me emotionally captive by their behavior. 
You have to learn. It's not that it doesn't hurt. It's just that I'm not going to stay in a prison that you built for me. I'm not going to stay there, okay? I'm going to learn to let it go off of me. So think about David's emotions here. Again, he served Saul personally. His son, Jonathan, Saul's son, Jonathan, was his best friend. They knew each other super well. And I will tell you this, spears hurt more when they're thrown by someone close to you. They really do, okay? Uh, If your love language is words of affirmation, harsh words hurt more, okay? Life group, if you're in my life group, which we're meeting tonight, not most, everybody was meeting next week, but we're meeting tonight. Uh, If that's your... If that's your love language, boy, words hurt hurt, hurt a lot more. Now, you may have grown up in a home where you had parents, okay, that were spear throwers. You may have grown up in a home where maybe dad or mom was always ready to throw a spear at you verbally, and most spears are verbal. Most spears are telling you what you're not. Most most spears get into your heart. Remember the old sticks and stones will break my bones, but words, that That is the life in the pit of hell. Like most of us would rather be hit with a rock than hit with a spear verbally because that gets into your emotions. So some of you, you have these emotional insecurities and these fears because of how your parents or what your parents did or somebody in authority said to you over and over and over again to tell you what you weren't. I want to tell you something. Listen to me closely. God is not like that. God does not tell you what you're not. God tells you who you are. That is why he was willing to send his son to die for you. That, that's a lot of love that he would send his son to die for you. That's a lot of love, okay? God loves you. And and a lot of times we have this view of who God is as we view our earthly father, who we could never do anything right. And he's always looking to go, oh, you messed up again. Oh, he's always ready to throw a spear. Think about it. God's God, right? If he wanted you dead, he would have toasted you a long time ago. Like lightning bolt, he went, okay? He would have just went, okay? He would have flicked you like a roly-poly, like, you know, there you go. Some of you are like, what's the really pulley? You figured out. Um, okay. Yeah. So, so harsh words tend to hurt more. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can destroy me. Words can destroy us. So we got to be careful what we say. We got to be careful what was told us. So if you've been hurt by words, okay, I hope that today helps you some. So David, after the first two murder attempts, he actually marries into the family. I'm not sure what he was thinking other than that, that Michael Herney was, was beautiful, right? Very seductive, very beautiful. And, and he, he marries into it, all right? And, and it kind of goes back to normal. So Jonathan goes and talks to his dad and, and things go back to normal for a while. I said, whatever normal is for a spear thrower. But the more success David has, the more bitter King Saul gets, Okay, and, and we'll, we'll take off in, in chapter 9. Now, I'm adding some verses to this. It was a little too late after the PowerPoint. It says, Saul told his son Jonathan. Okay, this is, Saul's like, David, go out and fight battles. You know, Philistines are at war. And David went out and just won. I mean, got, just annihilated the enemy. You ever watch those movies? And, and I know, Chris, you guys like action movies where one guy like takes out everybody. Or this one little four foot two girl, you know, and there's all these big buff guys and she's just kicking everybody's tail. Just, and they're all laying there and she's like, wah, you know. And I'm like, hey, no, no. All the two guys got to do is tackle the woman and she be toast, right? It's like this reality thing. And then you look at the Bruce Lee or the Chuck Norris and all this stuff. And, and then, and, and they wipe out all these enemies. And you're like, that won't happen. And then you read the, the Old Testament and you're like, that totally can happen. Like one guy could totally wipe out a whole bunch of people. So I kind of had to change my theories on action movies. Like, no, they, the spirit of God comes almost like they can't. That's what David was doing. He was wiping out the enemy. But the more success he got, the more bitter King Saul got toward him. And this was his son-in-law now. In verse 1 of chapter 19, now he's going public with it, okay? Saul told his son Jonathan, David's best friend, and all the attendants to kill David. Can you imagine that? Like your best friend, somebody you love more than anything, having a leader going, you, know, you need to go kill him. Mm-hmm. He was so bitter. He was so angry. And, and Jonathan was very fond of David. And he warned David. He's like, my dad's trying to kill you. Man, he's trying to kill you. And David's like, yeah, tell me about it. He's already thrown the spear at me twice. He says, well, now he's ordered us to put a hit on you. Be on your guard, right? Tomorrow morning, okay? Go into hiding. He's warning him, you got to get out. And, and if you read the rest of the story, his wife, Michael, helps him. And Jonathan's like, I'm, you know, I'm going to, I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself. Jonathan's ta- he's like, I'll talk to my dad. I'll see, whatever, we'll see, see where he's at, and then I'll get back with you. And Jonathan, in verse 4, spoke well of David to Saul, his father, and said to him, he said, don't let the king do wrong to his servant. 
Okay, David has not wronged you, and what he has done has benefited you greatly. He took his life in his hands when he killed the Philistine. The Lord won a great victory for Israel. You saw and you were glad. Why would you then do wrong to an innocent man like David, trying to kill him for no reason? And verse 6, Saul listened to Jonathan, and reason took over, and he took this oath. He said, as surely as the Lord lives, David will not be put to death. Now, what he was speaking really was prophetic because David would not be put to death. But Saul, again, would try to kill him. So Jonathan called David and he told him the whole conversation. Hey, everything's cool. I talked it out. Dad's not mad at you anymore. You can come back work in the palace. And I'm sure David was like, you sure? Like the guy tried to kill me. Okay, you walk into work tomorrow and have your boss shoot at you twice and miss. If my staff walks in, and I am going to shoot, I will not miss. But I'm not going to do that. Okay. Uh, all right. for, so fortunately, Saul was a bad spear thrower. Okay. And, and God also had a plan. So everything's cool. All right. Once more, broke, war broke out. Verse 8. And David went out and fought the Philistines. He struck them with such force that they fled before. He goes out wins a bunch of victories. The women are singing again. David's amazing. And Saul's like, ah. He gets angry again. And here's what happened. An evil spirit from the Lord came upon Saul as he was sitting in his house with a spear in his hand. Okay? Because insecure leaders always have a spear. Insecure leaders, if you're afraid of your kingdom, always have a spear and it's always ready to throw. Okay? While David was playing the harp like normal, Saul tried to pin him to the wall with his spear. But David eluded him as Saul drove the spear into the wall. That night, David made good as if. Something tells me this time was different. Something tells me the first time it talks about him throwing it. I think this time, I think he tried to drive it into. I think he came off his, his throne and is like, I'm not going to throw it. I'm going to try to get him like this. Yeah, I just think that. And he drove it into the wall. And David, again, ducks. And David's like, you missed me, you missed me. No, you, uh-huh, huh. no. David now is like, I'm done. <laughs> like three strikes, you're out. You told me you weren't going to kill me, and now you just tried to do that. So let's talk about this just for a moment. What, what was King Saul, what was he telling Jonathan? He says, I've changed. I've changed. Okay, I'm not going to do it. You ever, you ever talk to somebody who, like, they're trying to win you back, and they're like, I've changed. Grin for effect. Okay. Oh, I've changed. Like, you're like, I'm done with you. Oh, I've changed. It's been like five hours since I yelled at you. It's been a week since I hit you and beat you. But I've changed, right? I always say, be suspicious if somebody has to tell you they've changed. Because change isn't verbal. Change is behavior, all right? And, and ladies, don't buy into the, oh, I've changed, I've changed. Now, be, uh, don't buy into, be suspicious of it. You have a right to be suspicious. Come on. You have permission from me, your pastor, to be suspicious over somebody who's had this behavior. You're, you're ready to leave. You're ready to take the sugar away. And if you're not married, you shouldn't be giving sugar out anyway. Okay? Right. Just had to throw that in there. All right? I've changed, I've changed, I've changed. Okay? Well, you know what you can say? Prove it. Prove it. Prove it. I've seen so many times, okay, I'm just going to say it, so many times people will start going to church, they get religion real fast when they figure out, okay, you're a good Christian girl, you're going to leave, or a Christian guy, and they show up to church, and then they're, they're there, they're there, but it, most of the time isn't legit. Most of the time it's just, well, I'm going to be religious to get you back. I'm going to show you that, I, I'm going to raise my hands on my look, okay. I, I'm gonna love. Change is behavior, not words. Did I get a good amen? All right. True change, you will see the true change, okay? True change doesn't have to be told, it's seen, okay? It doesn't have to be told, it's seen. Behavior change is seen, not told. Um, all right, everybody get that? Because yeah. I'll keep harping. Yeah. That was like a salvo of many spears, <laughs> you know? Um, change, God wants us to see us change our behaviors, not just in words. I've changed. <laughs> well, David's in a hard situation, and you might be into, you might live with a spear thrower. You might, you might work for one. You might be around one that's around you a lot, and, and, and they just throw spears. And you know what? Again, like I told you, spears typically come verbally. It's telling you what you're not. And I'm not talking constructive criticism. We all need that. We all need to be told, hey, here's an area you can grow. And you know when somebody tells you and they love you that they just want to see improvement. But we hang around spirit throws sometimes and all they do is tear you down. If you feel worse about life 
After you've spent time with people, they're probably a negative spear thrower. See, my heart as your pastor, as your friend, okay, because we're all in this boat together, is there's times that I have to, to throw maybe spiritual spears that are intended to help you change behavior, but I say it because I love you, not because I hate you, right? If I didn't like you, I wouldn't tell you what your problem was. I'd be like, oh, it's going to keep getting them, man. It's, it's going to fester. It's going to destroy them. This is going to be great. No, a pastor has to be willing to say, hey, this is the truth, right? And I tell you it because I want your life to be better. I want your life to be free. I want you to live in freedom. So we've come to this point in the message with the question, how does this apply to me today? Yeah, I know I'm supposed to forgive. I'm, yeah, I'm supposed to try to duck you know, people when they throw spears at me. But the fact is, is the spears will hit us. But the goal today is to look at the difference between Saul and David. Saul was bound by bitterness. David was freed by forgiveness. He he walked in freedom. He had a guy trying to kill him, okay? And he walked in freedom. He had a guy throw spears at him three times. He had a hit put out on his own son. I want you to kill David. David and his wife is like, hey, they're coming to kill you. And she's like, pretend to be sick. She lowers him out the window. Read the rest of the story. Lowers him out this window. And she puts this idol thing and some goat's hair by the pillow and covers it up. And the guys come in and they look. They're going to kill David. And they're like, oh, he's sick. They go tell King Saul, hey, he's sick in his bed. You know what King Saul says? He said, bring him up on his bed so I can kill him. And they go back down there and they go to the bed and they're like, hey, it's a dummy. And Michael's like, oh, sorry. You know, he told me he was going to kill me. It's, it's a whole Hallmark story. Um, <laughs> not really. Uh, <laughs> it's a little more deadly than Hallmark. All right. And, and so she's like, he said he was going to kill me, you know, if I didn't let him out. So she has a good story. They believe it. So, now, so he is so bent on killing this guy. And he spends the next, next 15 years. I'm reading through 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, just reading the whole story again. And he spends the next 15 years trying to kill the very one who helped his kingdom. It just doesn't make sense. Right? But Saul allowed that bitterness to stay in him and it destroyed him. All right? Here's what I don't like. Okay? Saul naturally lives in us. Saul naturally lives in me. He naturally lives in me. No one has to work at being bitter or jealous. No one has to work at it. I don't have to walk around with a spear. You know, I come in Monday morning and Pastor Stevie's like, oh, bro, what happened? I'm like, well, somebody said they didn't like my sermon. Spear. <laughs> so, uh, well, who said it? I, I don't remember. Because I forgave him. Everything's cool. Well, bro, you got a spear in your body. Well, I know, but it's okay. I'm really trying to work at being bitter about it, but I just can't. I mean, I'm just, I'm just like, God, just help me to be bitter. Help me to be bitter. Help me to be unforgiving. Help me to be, help, help this get into me, Lord. And God's like, no, I'm not going to help you do that. I, I, that's not what's going to happen. Monday morning, staff meeting, bro, I'm going to tell, you know what so-and-so said? They said my sermon stunk. And they needed it more than anybody. That's usually how it happens, right? No, when we get a spear, we don't have to work on being bitter. We have to work on being graceful. And that's what comes down to the sugar shaker is we have a bitter situation. We have to add something to it. It's not that the bitterness disappears, Okay, because there are times, guys, in our lives that we want to throw the bitterness out and we can't. We can't because it's there. It's there. But if we add grace to it, we add forgiveness to it, it makes it tolerable. Okay? And that's what God wants to do in our lives. All right, let's just roll on. I'll get you out of here. I don't want you to hold nothing against me for preaching long. Uh, all right? Here's, here's what I know Saul's holding on to a kingdom that he needed to let go of. And David is not trying to take a kingdom that wasn't his to possess yet. Okay? It was going to be his. Saul here, he's trying to hold on to something he needed to let go of, and it just got him bitter. David's not trying to take a hold of a kingdom that wasn't his to possess yet. You know how David could have taken that kingdom quickly? Because David was a warrior. He was a fighter. He could kill people. He was professional killing at people. I mean, he was a professional killer. All right? He could have taken that spear out of the wall and said, Saul, I'm giving this back to you, buddy, and pegged him with it. He could have. And he could have stuck him and he would have been like, hey, Saul, you want this back, bro? Because I'll give it back to you right now. Flat! Yeah. And he'd have killed him and he could have said, I'm king now. I'm king! Me, David, me king. I had to change to get a reaction out of y'all because y'all just looking at me, right? Me, David, me king now, all right? He wasn't a caveman. Actually, actually, he was. He wrote a lot of the psalms from a cave, so I can't say that. Um, we'll get there. He did become a caveman. He lived in a cave because he was trying to get. He was trying to kill him. 
else. We'll talk about that actually next week. I have a story I want to tell you about that. And uh, you see how what I'm seeing is that the, the, the promise, David really could have said, you know what, Samuel said I was going to be king. He didn't say how, he didn't say when, so maybe I need to ki- ki- kill King Saul, and then when I kill King Saul, everybody already likes me, so they will usher me into his throne. Yeah. Can you see how he could have justified it? Totally justified it. Like, no, I'm going to kill him back and then I'll be king and everything will be cool. Maybe that's how God wants to do it. No, that's not how God wanted to do it. There's four things I want to leave you with. Number one, uh, David's response to spear throwing. Okay, he, he ducked. He just ducked. He, he learned just how to duck. We need to learn how to duck when things happen. Number two, he didn't throw it back. That would have been the natural reaction of all of us is to throw it back. Again, most spears are verbal. This is what a lot of you deal with. You like Verbal, it's just like, man, it really hurts. But we have to learn to not throw them back because that's our, that's our reaction. Right? You say something mean to me, I'm going to say something back. Most marriage fights are like this. Most marriage fights get into stuff that you didn't even start fighting about. You started fighting about over here, and all of a sudden you're into this whole thing. You ever been there? And you're like, how do we get to this point? It's like you keep trying to one-up each other. It's like you're lobbing mortars over at each other. Boom, you know? And then the, the rocket launcher. And sometimes, some of y'all, you, you're like the nuclear submarine. Your finger's on the button, but you're silent. <laughs> right? Anybody married to one of those? Don't, don't, don't. Just say yes in your mind because their finger is on the button right now, all right? So you be silent on the way home, but boy, once you get through the garage door, the nuke's going to go off and you will have a terrible last uh, Sunday afternoon and you'll have to come to my life group just to pick up the pieces, all right? <laughs> Number three, he didn't fight, he fled, okay? He didn't fight back, he'd fled the situation. You have to know when to get out of a situation. Now, don't misinterpret what I'm saying because some of y'all are like, well, he's not a Hallmark guy, so I'm going to find one. Um, Hallmark guys are fake. Right? Okay. Well, she's not the porn star. Well, she shouldn't be. Okay? Pornography, Hallmark, okay, social media, those things give you a fake idea of what relationships are about, guys. Okay? That's why they're so deadly and so dangerous. Okay? So have, have real expectations. All right? Don't do things that feed your discontent. Okay? He's not. She's not. Well, love, love, love them. Okay? Love them. Add sugar. All right? Number four, he forgave. Sounds easy. Much harder to do. But he learned how to do it. He learned how to forgive. David was wounded deeply by Saul's action. You need to know that. You need to know that, well, well that's, you know, that's David. You know, he just shook it off. No, he didn't. Chapter 20, verse 1 shows you something. He says this. Now, David fled from Naoth at Ramah, and he went to Jonathan, his best friend, and he asked, this is what he asked. He says, what have I done? Like, what, what is my crime? How have I wronged your father that he's trying to kill me? He is like, this is hitting him hard. He's asking why. What, what did I do? And, and some of you may be in that same place today. You think bad things have happened because, it's because of what you did. Like, what did I do, God, that you did? I said, God doesn't punish people like that. God's not mean. Okay, he's not mean. Does he discipline us? But he doesn't punish us like that. And some people have this idea that's who God is because my dad, if I did this and my dad beat me or whatever, is God's not like that. Okay? God is a loving God. Does he put up with sin? No. He did something about sin, and that's called Jesus. Okay, but, but he, he doesn't just put up with it. All right, sin will be dealt with, but he does have grace for us when we blow. But it's okay to ask those questions. And that may be where some of you are today. Like, I'm going through this hurt. I've had spears in me, and, and I don't know what I've done. It may be that you didn't do anything wrong. It may be that you did everything right. And that's why some people throw stuff at you, okay? Because there's a jealousy, there's a bitter, bitterness on this end. But he was wounded deeply by Saul's actions, okay? Why did this happen to me? It's okay to ask why. It's okay to be honest. It's to be okay to vent toward God. Do you know that God is big enough to handle your venting? Yeah. Like when you're like, God, why did this go on? I don't think God and Jesus are up there on the thrones because the Bible says that, you know, Jesus is sitting next to the Father. And I don't think God watches you vent and he's like, Jesus, he's hurting my feelings. <laughs> I don't think God talks like that. Just don't treat me disrespectful. But, but I don't think God and Jesus are having this conversation about your hurt and your bitterness. And, and you're just saying, God, why, why, why? That, that doesn't happen. What I think God does is say, you know what? Hey, Jesus, look, he's, he, he's talking to me. She's talking to me. They're hurt. They're venting. And, and they're saying some mean words, okay? Maybe even directed at me. But because of God, he's God. He can handle it. He's got big shoulders. He can handle your whining, living, complaining moments. He can, all right? God, God's big enough to do that. What I think, I think God's just glad you're talking to him about it. Yeah. You're already feeling it. I think God says, you know what? They, they trust me enough to talk to me about it. They trust me enough to be honest. Even Jesus asked that question, right? Okay, it hurts when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. He says, Father, do I have to go through this? Like, is there any other way? I can, is there any other way? And, and he says, but, but your will be done, not mine. 
that Jesus, the only way for him to die for our sins was on a Roman cross. That was the only way. And he became that sacrifice, and he was willing to do that. So here's what I know about questions. The questions you ask as to the why, why is this happening, they don't make you unspiritual, they make you human. They make you human. So be a little bit more graceful for yourself. You know what they also make you? They make you an honest person. Here's where I'm at. I just need to vent. So I think God is proud of you for being who you are. So how can I live a life of emotional freedom? Easy answer, grace and forgiveness. All right, go home, practice it. Um, you're done. No. Okay, a lot, a lot harder to live than to, to talk about. Okay, grace and forgiveness toward yourself. Some of you have a hard time forgiving yourself. Will you listen to me on this? Some of you hold your, your, your past against yourself, a past that God is not even holding against you. Okay? Some of you are holding a past against yourself that even God, creator of the universe, is not holding against you. And I would tell people, don't play bigger than God. Don't play bigger than God's forgiven you, is forgiven, all right? You have to learn how to let go of it, all right? And just and to move on and maybe again, wake up every day and forgive yourself. So last illustration I have, all right, is this. I want you to leave this place thinking, what am I going to be? <laughs> a frying pan? Or Velcro? Okay. Yeah. Here's what we got. What's, what's Velcro do? Sticks, right? Okay, you can have a personality that you get offended and, and everything sticks to you. Offense, traffic, harsh word, whatever it is. It's just stick, 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 stick. Or you can stuck more second service than first service. Or you can be like Teflon, okay? Doesn't stick to Teflon. Are you going to be Velcro or are you going to be Teflon? When somebody offends you, are you going to be Velcro or are you going to be Teflon? Now, some of you have a different idea of what should be done with a frying pan. <laughs> you don't know like this, all right? No, it's got to be like this, okay? Velcro, Teflon. When somebody throws a spear at you, Velcro or Teflon, is it going to stick? Are you going to let it stick or are you going to let it slide off? So much easier to preach than live, isn't it? Okay, but I want you to think about that. My job is to, to make you think about life and how, how am I going to react when things happen to me. All right. Did you learn? Yeah. Okay. Last verse I want to share with you. Some of you may need to, to write this down. Luke chapter 6. This is what Jesus said when he's talking about love for your enemies. He said, but to you who are listening, I say love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. And the verse is not there. And, and be nice to those who cut you off in traffic. Yeah. All right. That is a hard thing to do, but this is Jesus talking. And this is Jesus talking right before he was crucified. That he had that thing is, I'm going to be Teflon. I'm going to forgive. I'm just going to be graceful. Easy to preach, hard to live. But if you want to live in freedom, you'll learn to do it. Amen. Be the sugar. Be the sugar. Be the sugar to bitter situations. Some people, you know, they, they're, their bitterness, just try to be the sugar. If, if, as, much, as much as you can, try to be the sugar. Amen? Amen. All right. If you bow your heads with me, I think we've gone long enough. All right. But a question that I have for you is this, okay? And it has to do with eternity. It has to do with heaven and hell. That heaven and hell are real places. There's only two places that we go. And if we don't have this dealt with, everything I preach really means nothing. Now, here's what I know. There's a God that loves you very much. There's a God that saw us stuck in our sin, bound for hell because of our sins. And he decided to do something about it because you mean that much to him that he sent his son to die for us. Three days later, he came back to life. But if you have never given your life to Jesus Christ, if you, if you don't walk in freedom and you just have this, like something's wrong, I've tried all this stuff and nothing's happening, you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, he is the sugar you need. He is the grace, he is the forgiveness to forgive you and set you free from the sin that you got yourself in. I made this decision when I was younger. I had to say, Jesus, I, I'm a sinner, I need a savior. And if that's you today, if you would just raise your hand where I could see it just quickly, I'm not going to embarrass you, point you out. But if that's you, I don't want you to leave this place not knowing how to get to heaven, not knowing what life's about. It's about serving God, and it starts at the cross. Is there anybody at all in this place that needs to give your life to Jesus? Just lift your hand up so I can see it. All right. Okay, I see some hands. All right. That's good. And here's what we do as a family. We just pray it together as a church family. If you're online, um, and I hope this meant something to you as well. And if you need to give your life to Jesus today online, just pray along with us. So let's just let's repeat it. Dear Jesus, I believe that you died for my sins. I ask that you forgive me of my sins. Come into my life. Be my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now, thank you for making that decision. That's good. All right. All right.
Well, praise God. I'm glad you're here. If you're here for the first time, I always preach this long. Um, actually, I, I went a little bit longer today, but uh, yeah, let's see who's in the back. Is it Katie? Katie and Scott, all right. I got to see back there, right? Yeah. If you need a, a, a Change Life Church cup, again, it will change your life. Holds more coffee than the average cup, which makes you a happier person, all right? Love you all. Thank you so much for being here again. Our life group, we'll see you tonight at 6 o'clock. Have a wonderful day. And uh, Wednesday night, we have church, full church service, so show up 7 o'clock. <laughs>